record. We're now recording. Take it away, Maria. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the monthly breakfast co-sponsored by the Association of Conflict Resolution of Greater New York and the City University of New York Dispute Resolution Center at John Jay College of Criminal Justice. I'm Maria Volpe, where I'm a professor at John Jay College of Criminal Justice. This morning is our 257th <laughs> monthly breakfast since 9-11. When I started these breakfasts, they were held in person and many of you came uh, when you were visiting New York or when you were able to come to John Jay College since the beginning of the pandemic, since April 2020, we've been holding these online. And uh, we're delighted that we now have a global audience every month, and it's a much larger audience than we could have ever have envisioned in person because we had to wait for our colleagues from around the world to be in New York uh, to join us to, or we all had to get up really early to, to make it to the uh, in-person <laughs> breakfast. We all miss the bagels and coffee, but it's really wonderful to see everyone uh, wherever you are in whatever part of the world. These uh, breakfast sessions are recorded. They are posted on www.acrgny and on the CUNY Dispute Resolution Center's website at www.jjay.cuny.edu <laughs> front slash dispute resolution. <laughs> Sorry about the <laughs> mouthful there. Uh, these breakfasts are put together each month by a wonderful team that I work with, consisting of Julie Denny, Matthew Latimer, Nikki Borofsky, and Emily Skinner. Thank you for all of your time and assistance every month in putting these together. Today, we are absolutely delighted to have with us Bob Bordone, and Julie will introduce him uh, more formally in just a minute. Many of you know uh, Bob from the listserv. He posts these amazing videos. I, I'd love to know what it takes to do those. Uh, Bob, you do such a phenomenal job. Thank you so much for being with us this morning. Um, it's such a pleasure to have you uh, in person, virtually with us. Uh, in addition to all the recordings that you share on a regular basis. And now I'm going to turn it over to Julie to introduce Bob. Julie. Thanks, Maria. So Bob Burdoyne, I keep saying that Burdoyne is an internationally recognized author, speaker, teacher in negotiation, conflict resolution, mediation, and facilitation. A senior fellow at Harvard Law School, he served on the full faculty of, I'm sorry, sometimes there are limitations to Zoom, of Harvard Law School for more than 20 years as the Thaddeus R. Beale Clinical Professor of Law, Director and Founder of the Harvard Negotiation and Mediation Clinical Program, before launching his full-time consulting, advisory, speaking, and training practice. He also teaches at Georgetown University Law Center as an adjunct, and he's been a visiting clinical professor of conflict transformation at Boston University School of Theology. Um, he works with individual, nonprofit, governmental, and corporate clients across many sectors, and while at Harvard Law School, Bob led the school's flagship negotiation workshop and developed several new classes. He's the recipient of many rewards for conflict resolution, reform, design, implementation of systems, and he's the co-author of two books. And I could go on for a long time, but as I said to Bob, I'm going to cut it short now because I know you'd rather hear him than me. So, Bob, take it away, and thank you. 
Julie, uh, thank you for that really lovely in, uh, introduction. And uh, Maria and Julie and the whole planning team, thank you so much for inviting me to be here today. Um, and thanks to all of you for joining. I, I, I confess I had no idea the group would be this big. Um, so I'm excited and I'm nervous, but I'm really delighted because part of what I'm going to be talking about today uh, is I think a lot of stuff that many of you have a lot of familiarity with, and I suspect all of you have some familiarity with, with maybe some twists. Um, I've given uh, riffs of this presentation before, but not to a dispute resolution audience um, yet. Um, I've given it to doctors and I've given it to government officials and law students. So for me today, this is a chance to kind of test some of my own thinking on this topic of conflict resilience um, and hopefully just have a really good and lively conversation um, as we begin the new year. Um, uh, a few days ago, I was looking at all of the guests you've had in the past and I have to say I was quite intimidated, uh, but also comforted some of my friends. I think you had Andrea Schneider, was it last month? Um, yes. uh, who's somebody I know well and Dan Shapiro, I think you had not so long ago. And yep. I was in Dan's wedding uh, as, as a groomsman. So I was like, okay, there's some people I know in this group. And then all these people I know of who I admire and look up to. And so, um, and it's just really nice looking at, as people were joining, I was like, oh, these are many names. Some people, I, some of you I know, but some of you I know from your emails and the work that you do. So so thank you for um, beginning, beginning the new year and an early morning um, with this. So I'm gonna share a slide deck and I should say that I'm very happy to ultimately, if it's helpful, share these slides um, as well. Um, so you're welcome to take notes on things that are not on the slide, but you don't need to take notes on things that are, assuming that there's probably some way of getting you these slides. Maybe when when the video gets posted, we could put a link or something. Because uh, I could even send them as like a Dropbox link or something. Yeah, that's what we do, Bob. So Great. feel free. Yep. Great. Okay, good. So... Uh, Hopefully you can see that uh, yep. in some way or another. Um, yes. Yep. Totally. Great. Okay, good, 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 good. I'm gonna make it so I could at least see some of you on my screen. There's too many of you, I can't see everybody. Um, make sure that I see the chat. Um, so the other thing to say is feel free to put questions along the way. I, I've, uh, I've indicated to Nikki that if the questions become so overwhelming that, uh, you know, I can't get through it, I'll, I'll I'll say that. Um, so I, I kind of want to say that this is really both related to and yet distinct from conflict resolution. So I think of conflict resilience um, as something quite different, um, but really pre re prerequisite and necessary piece of conflict management or conflict handling or dispute resolution. So today, um, my intention is to tell you what I mean by this topic why I think it's incredibly important in this particular historical moment, um, especially in the United States, but not limited to the United States. Um, what are the component parts of conflict resilience? What implications I think it might have for those of us whose work is in mediation or conflict management generally, which I know is some of the people on this uh, call, but probably not everybody. And then just to make sure we have some time for questions and discussion. Um, so I think, you know, let me start with the what, right? Um, I'm guessing um, if you're like me um, and you see people who are maybe protesting or having messages like some of what we see coming up um, on really contentious issues, whether it's around immigration or abortion or the role of police and criminal justice in our society or climate change, um, that at least at times, depending on where you land, when you hear some views that are stridently opposed to your own, the first thing that does not come to mind for most people, although maybe maybe Prabha is different, uh, but for most people is, oh, wouldn't it be nice to have a conversation with them? A real dialogue, right? I think often we think maybe I want to persuade them or even more likely, Maybe this should increase my willingness to donate to the cause of my choice, um, to uh, canvas, 
uh, to make sure that I and every single person I know who's over the age of 18 is voting in the next election cycle, um, uh, that I somehow get involved, right? That I volunteer to make a dis difference. Um, and I wanna say that I think all of these things are very important and very good. So I wanna start with this, right? Uh, because I think that advocacy and engagement in civil society is really, really important. Um, but it is also my view, right, that in this moment, um, advocacy alone, voting alone, civic engagement um, around canvassing or donating uh, are not gonna be the things that ultimately resolve our problem of polarization in this country. Um, and I think that the polarization issue has really become more urgent even in the past few years, right? Partially I've seen the, the effects in our society of the COVID pandemic and really exposing the deep economic disparities in this country, um, certainly uh, issues of racism um, and racial justice that I think were reawakened in many people or awakened for the first time uh, coming out of George Floyd's murder. Um, the reality of the climate crisis. I mean, so for those of you who are on the on uh, in the informal breakfast, we were talking about the weather, and we were talking about sixty degree weather in New Jersey in January. Right, that's not normal. <laughs> um, and then, right, we see just literally political violence growing. Um, and at this moment, right, we find ourselves where we have one, you know, one of the two houses of our legislature cannot even organize. Um, and so how can we address this? Um, I wanna suggest that this notion that I'm gonna introduce of conflict resilience is a first and necessary step. And I define conflict resilience as the ability to sit with and be fully present around those with whom we have fundamentally different views on critical issues, issues that kind of cut to our core, listening with generosity and sharing our views with authenticity and grace. So I want to say a few things about this definition um, that I think make it maybe controversial <laughs> and certainly hard to do. And I would argue, and I'd love to get your thoughts on this, uh, but I would argue uh, make it less seen in our society in the past, I would say, at least five years, if not more. So the first important piece is conflict resilience, in my mind, is detached from problem solving and resolution. Um, it doesn't... It doesn't say that that's a bad thing, right? But this notion of conflict resilience is the idea of sitting in the presence of those with whom we disagree and frankly are unlikely to agree with and still finding some way to talk about the way we see the world and the why in a way that's non-avoidant, that doesn't skirt the toughest issues and that frankly is deeply uncomfortable. But done in still a way that increases the likelihood that the other can hear us, and then also listening in a curious and generous stance, um, even though it's gonna make us very uncomfortable, and then sitting in that discomfort. Um, and what comes from that can be a whole bunch of the work that we do, uh, or many of us do, or not, because some of the problems may not get solved. And part of my thesis or argument here is that conflict resilience, this kind of sensibility and set of skills are critically important and maybe even more important than the resolving skills or the, the problem solving skills that have often been the focus of my work and probably the work of many people here. Um, so let me. Um, kind of say a little bit more about kind of the why I think this is important, right? We have all, we have, you know, all of you here do conflict work all the time. We have many academics, we have people, at, I saw people at the CRS, at DOJ who do this, right? And we know that there's some common conflict handling approaches. So a common conflict handling approach, uh, a way of resolving the conflict is around fighting, right? This is, um, can take the form of kids brawling or people arguing or for those of us who are in law, um, we have these more kind of rules-based and dignified ways of fighting in a courtroom, but it's, it's still basically fighting. Um, 
or certainly in our government, right? The way we do it is often, unfortunately, in games of chicken and stare down contests. Again, that's literally what's happening in the first week of the new year, year on, in one of the uh, houses of our government. Um, and then more and more frequently, um, violence like, um, and we see the violence of January 6th, but we also see uh, isolated, but growing incidents, whether it's Paul Pelosi, whether it's Senator Ted Cruz having beer cans thrown at him. Um, and in the history of our country, right, we have seen it gotten worse, right? Um, in fact, our country fought, uh, for those of us who are American here on this call, um, you know, a war where 620,000 soldiers died. Just in, in, in today's terms, that would be 6.2 million Americans. And so even though we see this increase in fighting, um, I don't think this is probably super controversial, but maybe it is. I would just say it is unlikely that fighting is going to resolve the most polarizing issues that are facing our country. And that is because on any issue, right, whether whether it's abortion or immigration or climate, um, you could typically find at least 30% of the people and probably in many cases, 40 or 50% of the people who actually see the situation differently from you. And so the notion that somehow you can vanquish 35 to 40% or 45% of the population seems crazy. And even to me, if you think you could vanquish them, the cost would be incredibly high. But what we see is an increase of fighting as a conflict handling mode. The other thing that I think we see, and perhaps or arguably even more, and this is something that I definitely have saw in my teaching in law schools from, I would say, beginning around 2014 or 15 through today, is another common mode, right, which is fleeing. Um, and we in our society have much more artful ways of avoiding conflict than we did just 15 years ago. One of the biggest ways that we can avoid conflict is social media. Um, we create our own cocoons of comfort, our own echo chambers. Um, uh, I certainly know and, and have sometimes even been surprised. I try to keep a, a relatively diverse Twitter following. And then every so often I'll say something to someone and they'll be like, I have no idea what you're talking about. And I'm like, really? Because that seems like the biggest news. And they're like, I have no idea what you're talking about. Right? Because we end up, thanks to algorithms, thanks to our own discomfort, our own kind of desires to want to be around people that are like us, um, we could easily avoid those who see things differently. And then, of course, our news media have become so balkanized, um, you know, with all of the downsides, and, and there were many, for sure, of having kind of three broadcast networks that largely controlled the, the media ecosystem. Um, An upside is that we at least had a common set of information. Um, and now we just don't have that anymore. Um, one of the things that I have also seen, and particularly um, with, with younger people, um, are ways that we have made it easier to avoid the discomfort of difference or disagreement. Um, so certainly in the academic environment, um, the emergence of trigger warnings, um, allowing people to kind of leave the class when hard topics come up. Um, I have a colleague um, at Harvard Law School taught a family law class, and uh, a few years ago, one of her students came up and said to her the first day of class, I, I won't say the professor's name, she said, Professor, um, um, are there going to be trigger warnings in this class? And the professor looked, it's like, it's family law. The entire thing is the trigger. <laughs> like, no, right? Um, um, and we also see, right, a growing culture, uh, a, a growing kind of cancer cult, cancel culture. Um, all of this, I think, are ways that we can flee. In our own profession, um, this desire to avoid discomfort is changing the way we do our practice. Um, so recently um, in Alternatives Magazine, um, our colleagues Layla Love and Jerome Weiss and Eric uh, Galton uh, wrote a piece where they looked at research that has shown that mediators more and more are using caucus-only forms of mediation. 
So they are not bringing parties together ever, ever in the room together. And they're totally keeping them separate. And one of the things they talk about in, in this piece is a way in which um, the polarized political environment and the discomfort of being with people you disagree with has really contributed to this different form of mediation, right? And then you think about people like Karen Michael Meadow, who has basically said a caucus only form of mediation is not mediation at all. Um, and so fleeing, right, and fighting have really increased. And then of course, is this third approach, right? This, this thing that I would say, um, you know, many of us specialize in and work toward, which is fixing, which is problem solving. And, um, and I wanna be really clear, right? I, I am a, a huge advocate of problem solving. Uh, I mean, my entry into this field uh, in the late 1990s was getting a fellowship from the William and Flora Fula Foundation that was promoting negotiation and problem solving as, as part of a law school curriculum. And so problem solving is very important for sure. But I would say that one of the things that um, I have seen uh, very directly um, working with law students is that on issues that feel so divisive that they are not susceptible to problem solving, there is a reluctance to engage with the other side. And I think that that is a big loss. Um, I think that conflict resilience means that we need to engage with the other, even if there's not gonna be a shared thing we're gonna do at the end, three great uh, things we agree on, Right, but, and I'm gonna talk about why, I a little bit more about why I think that matters, right? Because we have seen such a transformation over the past two decades. Um, this is a picture of both houses of our legislature singing the national anthem on 9-11. Um, it's hard to think that, you know, 22 years later, that if something similar happened in this country, that we would see an image like this. Um, I mean, I think that's, I think it's unlikely. Um, instead, what we've real, really seen is a, a fraying of uh, the kind of political civility um, that is very similar to the way things frayed in the decade before the Civil War. So I've taught a class called um, Political Dialogue in Polarizing Times. And for one of the sessions, I wanted to look at what was the dialogue in the United States in the decade before the Civil War? Because it's not the case that in that decade, people were going around saying, coming up next, the Civil War. Um, they just were not doing that, right? Uh, but we see some really scary similarities in my mind, right? So um, viol actual violence or threats of violence or, uh, uh, or very um, hateful language, right? on the floor of the House and the Senate. So this is a, a picture of Charles Sumner actually being caned um, um, in, in the chambers uh, of Congress. Uh, and another picture of Senator Lindsey Graham, you may remember this moment, kind of spewing a lot of vitriol during the confirmation hearings of now Justice Kavanaugh. The other thing that you see is um, never ending negotiation with no resolution and compromises that nobody think resolve anything. So for example, right, the Missouri Compromise. It is not the case that when the Missouri Compromise was agreed to that people said, well, I'm so glad we solved the slavery issue. Like nobody said that. It's also the case that when we have these agreements that will build 200 miles of a wall, to free up funds to do something else. And anyone says, oh, the immigration uh, crisis is solved. Uh, and so we tend to kick things down, kick hard issues down the road um, in ways that are quite troubling. Um, the other thing I would just say is the increasing ways in which we label each other and in which we see, I would call strategic silence taking the place of dialogue. So what do I mean by strategic silence? Um, Many of my colleagues and, and, my, and, my, and myself have noticed in law school classrooms, I would say beginning around 2015, a noticeable reduction 
in conversation and dialogue across lines of political difference in the, in the classroom in ways that they almost force faculty to take on a straw man view of the opposite side. Um, and this would trouble me enormously, right? I know, you know, thinking about, thinking about a place like Harvard Law School, where the biggest student organization is, is the Federalist Society, right? A more conservative group. And yet you would not hear those views voiced in a classroom. Um, and that feels troubling to me, right? Because I was also on the admissions committee. And when an admissions committee works really hard to create a diverse student body, but then we don't get the benefit of that in the classroom because people fear that they will be destroyed on social media, then we're losing something. And we're losing something, I think, really important to the Republic because those people will go on to be Ron DeSantis or Barack Obama or Justice Alito. And, and so that's really troubling. Um, a recent CBS News poll uh, asking people what the biggest threat to America's way of life was, right? The number one thing, 54% said other people in this country. So I want to suggest then that conflict resilience, this capacity to be uncomfortable in the face of difference um, is severely being lost and is desperately needed if we're to survive as a republic and is prerequisite to any other problem solving that may happen. It has independent benefits um, um, that are not connected to problem solving. Again, not, I'm not against problem solving, right? But even if there's no problem solving, independent benefits that we need in organizations and in our governmental institutions and in our schools, and I would say even in our families, right? One is just the ability to grow in empathy. Um, another, right, is a reduction in demonization. Um, and as somebody who does this work, right, I find myself constantly working hard to not demonize um, others who I think are unreasonable, unhinged, and, you know, and crazy, right? It's really hard work uh, and exhausting work. It's easy to talk about, it's much easier to talk about to all of you than to actually do it day to day. Uh, some of you may have uh, remembered this. Uh, not so long ago, uh, but some of you may know the group Brothers Osborne. Um, so they're a country music group. If you're into country music, you may know them, otherwise you may not. Um, but they're from Tennessee and the Tennessee legislature was going to honor them, uh, particularly one of the two, uh, TJ, who was the first openly gay, uh, first openly gay country music artist who had a big major, major record out, uh, uh, deal. From, um, and so the uh, the Senate had voted unanimously to do this. And then uh, one representative in the state house in Tennessee voted to block it. And what the brothers Osborne did in response was kind of pretty neat. And to me was an example of conflict resilience. Um, so they tweeted this, right? They say, we've lived in this state over half of our lives. Jeremy Fison, who is this, this uh, Tennessee representative, Honored Ben Shapiro, who doesn't even live here. Jeremy, let's have lunch one day on us. Would really like to know more about you as a person. But that's pretty amazing. He responded, I would be honored to break bread with you. Um, and then they said, we'll message you directly. And as, uh, as I understand it, right, um, they actually did eat uh, together. It didn't actually change as I understand it from what I may have, you know, I, I have not had first hand counts of this. I've been just doing research on it. I remember seeing the tweets and captured them because they were pretty moving to me. Um, didn't really change anyone's view, but it actually did um, allow the brothers to actually write a song and record their music video in front of the Tennessee State House. There's a song called Younger Me. Again, those of you who are country music fans know that that won a Grammy in 2022 uh, for best song by a duo. So there's something about this, right? That doesn't really shift views about the issue, but does shift views about the people involved um, that feels really important in this moment. Um, I would also say that the being conflict resilient, sitting in the presence of those we really disagree with and hearing their stories and sharing ours um, does actually increase trust because you become a three-dimensional person and therefore our ability to coexist peacefully. 
Um, some of you may know the, the podcast called The Experiment. If you don't, it's a great podcast produced by WNYC. Um, really, The Experiment is our democracy. And uh, uh, some months ago, they had uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Anthony Fauci. And um, Fauci, uh, they asked him about some of the work that he did on HIV AIDS in the late 80s and 90s. And uh, for those of you who are around at that time, or you may remember that um, Fauci was um, not really admired by an, an, a non-trivial part of the queer community. And in fact, um, activists at ACT UP felt that he was not vocal enough, wasn't um, inclusive enough, wasn't advocating enough for addressing what was actually a pandemic. Uh, of going on, right, affecting a particular community, but a pandemic that was in a way like COVID. Um, and um, Larry Kramer, who's the head of ACT UP, ends up writing an op-ed in the Village Voice where he calls Fauci a murderer and compares him to uh, uh, Adolf Eichmann, right, who was a Holocaust organizer. And Fauci's response is pretty amazing. And to me, an example of conflict resilience. I wanna play you just a clip of him talking about this on this podcast. And if you can't hear this, please let me know. We tested it, but maybe it won't work. We have to go back two years to 1988, uh, to that letter that Larry Kramer wrote to Fauci where he uh, called him a murderer. Do you remember that? Yeah. The whole murderer thing? Of course, of course. When Dr. Fauci saw that letter, he thought- If somebody, is that angry to be able to print that in a national newspaper? I mean, I got to find out what is it that has stimulated him to do that? So he just called this guy who called him a murderer, called him on the phone and said, let's figure this out. So what's amazing about this, uh, well, I think that's amazing. <laughs> um, but what also is amazing is that this begins a series of weekly dinner dinners on Friday nights at Fauci's house between some members of ACT UP uh, in the DC area, because he was at NIH, um, and Fauci, um, and then conversations that actually ends up, now I just want to be clear, right, for my purpose of comic resili resilience, this is not the point, although I think it's great, it actually ends up shifting how Fauci does some of the studies. But importantly, right, um, they each learn about each other. It's interesting because I had prepared this, uh, I prepared this talk before December 31st. But then on New Year's Eve, there was an op-ed, uh, because as you know, Fauci ended his service um, uh, with the NIH at the end of the year. And uh, it turns out one of the uh, one of the guys, his name is Peter Staley, who was uh, a regular dinner guest um, at the Fauci household uh, on New Year's Eve, ends up writing the, this op-ed about this experience of being in dialogue and conversation with Fauci at this time when, you know, ACT UP was not a gentle organization and this was not academic and it was particularly, it's not academic to anybody, right? But particularly to that community. Uh, I've, I've myself found, uh, and Maria kind of referenced these videos, some of you probably are, are sick of me occasionally sending a note to the listserv about some YouTube video that I did. Um, but one of the things that I have um, found at times challenging, but also at times really edifying, is engaging someone who puts a comment, um, puts a comment uh, into one of my videos and turning it into a conversation. And sometimes that doesn't, sometimes I don't do that because I'm tired and don't have the time. Sometimes I try to do it and it doesn't work. Uh, where work means that we just learn more about each other, right? And sometimes it really does. Um, and it's really interesting. I mean, you don't need to read this and I, I won't even keep it up and I blocked the person's name, right? But this is a video I did on the midterm elections where it kind of feels like someone's kind of saying, get out of your bubble, Bob Bourdon, which is good advice, but maybe not artfully delivered. And it ends up turning into this conversation that went on for some time. And this is somebody who, uh, uh, this is somebody who, you know, voted for J.D. Vance, who uh, is a MAGA Republican, and so really isn't of my politics, 
Um, and, you know, isn't even like a Chief Justice Roberts conservative, right? It's like really like in a way, not my people. But there was something about that experience for me that um, really like, I feel like made me a better person, right? Um, helped me see also that this person that I, you could just say, oh, they're a MAGA, da, da, right? Actually, like, had lots of views and opinions, many of which were different, but I can engage a conversation with them. Um, you know, and did this change the world? Obviously not, right? Um, but I think these kinds of interactions are meaningful and important. I think they increase our capacity for problem solving, but I think we have to do this work before we get to the problem solving. We can't get around it. In uh, this past semester, I was teaching a negotiation class at Georgetown, and um, there's a particularly tough simulation that I use. It's a forced decision simulation, um, a riff off of COVID, although it's not COVID, but it's um, a number of people. Uh, a number of people uh, have qualified for a vaccine, uh, but only but there's only a certain number of doses. And so the committee has to decide who gets the vaccine and who doesn't. Um, so it's a pretty consequential decision. Each of the each of the kind of seven choices have aspects of them that are attractive and less attractive. They're all qualified. And uh, a number of the groups just ended up doing it by lot, by chance, right? So they didn't really have much of a discussion. They didn't articulate criteria. And... Uh, as, as the negotiation professor, I can say this did not please me too much. I mean, <laughs> uh, but so I kind of asked the class like, hey, like, well, like, why didn't you dig into some kind of criteria? Because next week, there's probably going to be another seven doses, right? And you're gonna have to make some other decisions. And someone raised their hand and said, well, you know, Professor Bourdon, uh, the thing is, like, if we had talked about criteria, like they're probably, we wouldn't have gotten along very well and it would have been really unpleasant. Do you have any ideas about how we can do that where it would not be unpleasant? And I said, no, no, I have no ideas actually. <laughs> These, like I have ideas on how to make this process better. I have ideas on how we could speak about this in ways that increase the likelihood that we could hear each other and also speak from our own experience, but I have no ideas and how to remove the discomfort. So I think to do good problem solving, right, we have to be ready to enter into that just uncomfortable space. And I wanna also just make one thing uh, clear because I think in one of the presentations I gave, I think I was a little misheard on this. Um, I wanna really distinguish discomfort from trauma. So um, I, I think that this, this quality of conflict resilience is something we should all have. And it doesn't mean that every single day we have to put ourselves or ought to put ourselves into conversations around differences, especially when we, there is trauma that could be uh, relived or reactivated, uh, uh, right? Um, and in any individual case, I certainly am not qualified to be the arbiter of discomfort from trauma. <laughs> Um, but I want to make that distinction, right? Because discomfort, I'm, I'm actually all for it. <laughs> Putting yourself in the trauma, no, that's different. Um, some of you might know or have heard of Loretta uh, Ross. She's a professor at Smith. And um, she has talked about this idea. But I bet she'd be a really great person to invite if you haven't invited her. Uh, although I don't think she's a conflict resolution or conflict management person. But, um, but she has embraced a, an approach that she says, instead of calling people out, how do we call them in, right? So how do we stand our ground, hold our views, but hold ourselves back from villainizing? And um, uh, some time ago, she was on uh, the radio program, some of you may know it, On Point. It's produced out of WBUR in Boston, but it's a, it's a nationally syndicated show. And I, I wanted to share a clip of the conversation and her way of kind of thinking about this. Um. You know, your experience as, as a, a black feminist civil rights advocate, you know, you're talking about 
<laughs> the clan a second ago. What does that have to do with the digital calling out culture now that we seem to be surrounded by? Well, I think that if a black woman can learn to have civil conversations with someone who's been in the Ku Klux Klan, we should be able to have civil conversations with everybody because we can't. We have to remember that there's humanity behind the words, that there's some there's humanity behind the actions. Now, I'm not necessarily talking about walking up to the boys in the hood and saying I want to be your best friend or anything, but at the same time, we can't be dehumanize people simply because we disagree with their political perspectives. Uh, thanks. Also, I have not been, because the, the chat has been so active, I've not been monitoring very much, but I just want to say thank, I just looked at it as I was listening. I mean, thanks to know that there's a TED Talk. I can't wait to see that. Also, Nikki, you're amazing. You put all these references down. Thank you so much for that. That's really <laughs> helpful. Um, okay. Wow. There's a lot going on there. Okay, so let me talk about, I feel like in some sense, this next part of the talk is uh, probably review for many of you uh, or riffs on what you do, not like the other parts weren't, but, uh, but I thought it would be helpful at least for me to say a few words about what I think are the elements of conflict resilience. If we, and people may agree or disagree whether, whether it's important or whether it's declined, um, so I'd be curious to hear your views on that. I, I feel like it's both important and has declined, right? I mean, my my hope, my argument is that in 10 years, people are like, we every leader needs to have emotional intelligence, right? That phrase, and also conflict resilience. So what are, in my mind, some of the pillars uh, or main parts of it? I would kind of put four, um, what I would call mindful awareness, um, curious listening, brave assertion, and low-risk containers. So mindful awareness. Um, so really, to me, what this is, is learning how to stop. Learning how to slow down the camera, or slow down the film, rather, and stop. Um, so I am currently uh, writing, very slowly, but writing, um, a book on conflict resilience with a neurologist uh, at NYU Langone. Um, that is really looking at both the brain science aspects, right? What happens in our brain when we feel that fight or fight or flight instinct, right? And then what are the interventions that we can make? Um, so this next slide is a slide that I did run down right by my co-author. Um, and he told me it's acceptable. <laughs> so, so. If there are neuroscientists or neurologists in the room, I beg your pardon. I am a a law educated, but uh, but hopefully this at least will kind of give a little a little sense of kind of what happens in the brain. I mean, so as best I understand it, um, right, our minds operate at two levels, right? There's a kind of conscious decision. I'm going to wake up early, go on, get my coffee, go on to Zoom and you know endure Bob Bourdon for 90 minutes um, and then there's this like hidden mind right um, where there's a whole bunch of automatic things going on that we're less conscious of so here we are we've made our coffee we brought the dog out we're turned the zoom on we're listening and then Bob says something that's really upsetting <laughs> like that feels completely off and totally contrary to the way I approach my work, to my beliefs, whatever, I feel triggered. Um, and what happens is that triggering actually does something physical to us. Um, a whole bunch of chemicals get released, right? And they actually flood that conscious mind part, right? We want to put, you know, some nasty thing in the chat, or maybe we private it to our, you know, our best friend on this, on this, you know, session, whatever it is, right? If we're in a conversation, it gets, it gets even worse. Um, and the thing is, if I keep on doing those things, um, you keep on getting re-triggered and we extend this, what is called emotional refractory period. And the emotional refractory period, depending on the way our individual brains work, can last for like five to 20 minutes. And in this period, we are 
the, that conscious part, right, is not working as well as it could. We are flooded. Uh, and it's not because we're bad people, right? It's because there are actual physiological changes. Our brains have changed, right? There's cortisol and adrenaline. And, and we probably all of those experiences of our, you really feel our blood pressure going up. Or like for me, it's really weird. My hands and feet get cold, like physically get cold. I'll be like, is it cold in here? Like I'm literally cold, right? Um, that results though in a bunch of things like you're a complete jerk or you never listen or you're a monster or fill in the blank, right? And then we become defensive and we attack and we blame, right? And it ends up in this pretty unproductive situation. So we have that dynamic going on. We have the emotional refractory period. And then that combines with something that um, some of you probably know, Keith Alred. Uh, I expect many of you know Keith Alred, but if you don't know Keith Alred, he's a guy worth knowing. Um, so he uh, is the executive director, director of the National Institute for Civil, uh, Civic Discourse. Um, but he, And he's formerly a, a professor at Harvard's Kennedy School. Uh, and he has done work on this, this dynamic that he has coined the accuser-excuser bias. Um, which works in this way, right? I say or do something that is experienced, let's say, by Maria as hurtful or upsetting or, you know, in some way bad, right? Because as human beings, we are more inclined to assume that somebody meant to do something. That's what's called the accuser bias. Maria says, you know what? Bob meant to be harmful. Bob meant to be hurtful. Um, and it's only then that she feels anger toward me. So in other words, she has to make a decision around whether I intended it or not. If she decides I didn't mean it, it doesn't mean she's not a little upset. It's like, whatever. But she doesn't feel angry toward me. But there's this accuser bias. Where, and, and Albert has a reason why um, he argues, at least we have this, right, that increases the likelihood that Maria or whoever the recipient is will decide I meant it, which then creates anger and then she'll retaliate, right? Retaliation can look like all sorts of things. Uh, an unkind word back, you know, a punch, uh, a passive aggressive thing, you know, in an email that she says reply to all, you know, fill in the blank, right? Um, I have something called the excuser bias. I did not mean that. Maria, you are overreacting. Take a chill pill. But boy, did you mean that, right? Excuse her bias, um, which then makes me feel angry. And I counter retaliate, right? And this is how we end up in a conflict spiral. And any of us who are mediators have seen this, right? You don't have to be a mediator to have seen this. Um, and um, what Alred argues is that as an adaptive tendency, like, you know, over the course of millennia, there's a lot to be said for this, right? In some mean, nasty, brutish world of I'm walking down a path late at night and it's dark and we bump into each other and I have to decide, did you mean that or not? And if you meant it, if I decide you meant it, I take out my club, I clobber you, you're dead, I'm alive. If I decide, I could be wrong, it doesn't matter, you're dead, I'm alive. If I decide you didn't mean it, and I'm wrong, you take out your club, clap me, I'm dead and you're alive, right? As an error to make, the accuser bias, at least at an existential level, makes sense, except for the fact that in our relationships, in our, in our country, in our communities, this is getting us into huge sorts of trouble. And so having a capacity first to just become mindful, to pause, and to say, I'm feeling all these things. Like, is this an emergency situation? What is the urgency of a response right now? To become aware of the refractory experience. So Matt, some of you may know Matt Lieberman's work at UCLA, right? And he has uh, done really interesting research on what he calls affective labeling. So the affect of labeling is slowing down, naming to yourself the emotions that you're feeling. Um, and that naming yourself, right? Um, you know, I often call it name entertainment, right? But that naming to yourself actually shortens the emotional refractory period. It moves 
the brain activity from the amygdala, which is that a more emotional response to the frontal lobe, which is the more conscious response. Then being able to say, okay, what are the sides of me that are curious about what this other person has said or done? Um, and then what are the sides of me that want to disagree or fight or run? And what are the sides of me that are confused? So I actually frame those three questions, not are there any sides of me that are curious or are there any sides of me? Because I think the yes or no makes it easier to just say no. Um, my own experience working even in coaching uh, or mediation situations, right, is sometimes I'll say, so what sides of you are curious? And they'll be like, none. I'm like, okay, but I want to push you. What aspect of you makes you wonder about? And almost always they'll come up with something right? Something that makes them curious. Um, but to really slow down and to name that, and then to decide how can I represent my, each of these sides of me in this conversation? It, is the timing right? But if not, can I set up some time to do that? And what are some strategies for handling the inevitable discomfort? Uh, strategies that are more than just avoidance. I think that first piece is really important. Um, the second piece, right, is listening. And, you know, I, I, I'd be surprised if anybody here is a opposed to listening, oh, but I'd love to hear that. Um, uh, but I, I think we all have some sense. We probably, many of us teach listening. Um, I usually teach of it as kind of having a, a number of component pieces, paraphrasing what you've heard, open-ended inquiry, and then a third part of, of what I call acknowledging, right? But this kind of open-ended inquiry part, I think can be really powerful. Um, you could probably tell from things I'm sharing with you that I really like podcasts. That is because I have a golden retriever and walk this golden retriever about an hour and a half a day and listen to lots of podcasts. Um, uh, anyway, I was listening. Um, I've done, I had the opportunity to do some work actually in the past with Dr. Rochelle Walensky, who's the uh, current head of the CDC. And, um, some of you may know that um, her work is in infectious disease generally, and she really kind of made her name um, working in HIV AIDS. And uh, I'm glad some people are, are walking their dogs this morning. My dog had a truncated walk this morning, but if I make it to 10 o'clock, okay, she'll, she'll get a longer walk. Um, uh, anyway, I was listening and, um, and this kind of open-ended question piece uh, kind of hit me. I was going to share a clip from this piece where she kind of talks about some of her work, early work um, working with HIV patients. First of all, thank you. Um, one of the things, I spent a lot of time with social workers in my HIV background, and one of the things they said is when you give a new HIV diagnosis to somebody, the next thing you do is wait and you don't speak again until they speak. And that gives you a sense of what it is that's um, that's hurting them the most. What are they worried about? Are they worried about their job? Are they worried about their safety? Are they worried about their children? Are they, you know, what is it that there's been, and that's usually the next thing that comes out. So I don't think we've given that voice to people who don't wanna wear a mask. What is it that, or who don't want a vaccine? What is it that's worrying you the most? So I just love that question, right? What is it that's worrying you the most, right? Cause it's very open. Uh, and non-directive, right? First of all, thank you. We don't have to hear it again. Um, and then of course this next piece, right? Well, the last piece, at least in, in the way I think about uh, and teach and try to practice active listening is around just the acknowledgement of emotion, um, which is different from the agreement with the emotion, but just really hearing um, the strong feeling that people may have, whether or not you agree you should, or you ought, or it's a good idea, or it's a bad idea. Um, uh, mostly because it's probably tiring to hear me so much. I'm going to share a, 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 just a clip. This is not around hard issues so much. It's from an animated movie that many of you may have seen some years ago called Inside Out. Uh, but to me, it's like this really beautiful clip of the power of acknowledging emotions. So I'm going to just give you a little context um, so that this clip makes sense. For those of you who have not seen the movie, uh, the movie, the action occurs entirely inside the brain of this little girl. Uh, whose name is uh, Riley. And um, the, the characters you're going to see in this clip are one, Bing Bong, that's the one that looks like an elephant, and it is her imaginary friend. 
and then two others, sadness and joy, respectively. And at this particular moment in the film, the sadness and joy are lost inside her brain. They need to get to the train station. The problem is the only one who knows where the train station is, is Bing Bong. But the additional problem is that at this point in the film, Riley is getting older and she's in the process of eliminating uh, her childish games, including the game she played with Bing Bong and ultimately Bing Bong. So that's, I think, enough context for you to kind of just kind of see then this cute clip, I think the power of acknowledging emotions. Pony Mount was right here. Hey, what's going yeah, on? Yeah, yeah, I, I don't know. We'll have to Princess back. Dream World! Oh, the, the stuffed animal hall of pain! My rocket! Wait, Granny and I were still using that rocket. It, it, it still has some soft power left. Who is your friend who likes to play? <laughs> Riley can't be done with me. Hey, it's gonna be okay. We can fix this. We just need to get back to headquarters. Which way to the train station? I had a whole trip planned for us. <gasps> hey, who's ticklish, huh? Here comes the tickle monster. Hey, Bing Bong, look at this. <laughs> Oh, here's a fun game. You point to the train station and we all go there. Won't that be fun? Come on, let's go to the train station. I'm sorry they took your rocket. They took something that you loved. It's gone forever. Sadness, don't make him feel worse. Sorry. It's all I had left of Riley. I bet you and Riley had great adventures. Oh. They were wonderful. Once we flew back in time, we had breakfast twice that day. Sadness! It sounds amazing. I bet Riley liked it. Oh, she did. We were best friends. <laughs> yeah, it's sad. <laughs> I'm okay now. Come on, the train station is this way. How did you do that? Uh, I don't know, I it was sad, so I listened to what- Hey, there's the train! So I just, uh, I love that piece, right? Um, because the acknowledgement, right, just opens up so much space. Um, for in this case, moving forward, right? But for more conversation or more opportunity. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the third pillar, right? Which is, I would call brave assertion. Um, and I think assertion is a topic that gets really confused <laughs> um, because I think that there is kind of a continuum between submission and aggression. And I think where assertion get confused is it gets misunderstood as aggression. Um, and excuse me, I think I'm going to sneeze or not. <laughs> excuse me. I'm so sorry, everybody. <laughs> um, now you're glad you're virtual though, right? <laughs> uh, thank you. Um, so, you know, submission, right? It's to me avoidance. It's neglecting your own viewpoint, your own rights, your own perspective, right? And aggression is unfortunately what we often see, um, I think, uh, to the degree we see engagement, right? It's really aggression. It's people pounding the table. It's people being insistent. Um, and assertion is really neither of those things. Um, assertion, right, has some, I think, important pieces to it, right? First, it is actually speaking to what you heard is important to them. Um, so listening first so that you can tie your views to something that you heard and what they said. Secondly, right, it's using a tool that I suspect most of you probably already know, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on, but I will say a little bit about, um, which is the ladder of inference. Um, so this is a tool 
where uh, many times around polarizing issues, especially when people are really emotional, um, they tend to have these disagreements at what I would call the top of a ladder of influence, uh, inference. So at the level of conclusion, the former president should be indicted. Uh, no, he should be reelected. Um, and then, you know, we can go back and forth and get louder, right? But what we know is that, well, those conclusions are typically derived from something in the universe, some available data that each of these people observed or saw and then filtered through some kind of reasoning process to reach a conclusion. And a much more productive conversation, by the way, not one that necessarily leads to the same conclusion, but a much more learning conversation actually explores the the data people have observed, the reasons why they chose that data, their reasoning, and the conclusion, um, and then says, and what may I have, what might I have missed? Um, third, right, really avoiding globalizations. You never, or or you always, right, just tend to get us into trouble. Um, and someone says, oh no, you know that's not true. In the leap year in two thousand four. You know, I agreed with you, right? It's like, it's not the point, right? And then really speaking from your own perspective. Um, so these pieces seem really important. Um, and what's really important, right, is to um, not shy away from the assertion piece. Um, and I think that that is something that um, I, I have seen happen a lot. Um, for some years, I taught a class called the Lawyer as Facilitator. And in the very first year I taught this class, uh, I mean, I learned, a, I mean, I'm always learning a lot, but you know, particularly the first year you learn, you teach a class, you learn, there's all these surprises that you wouldn't have expected. And so this is a, it was a, a four credit class, right? So it's a 48 hour class where the culminating project was I spent a lot of time getting real people in the universe to come in for dialogues on real issues that matter to them. So we had like an abortion one, we had an Israel-Palestine one. I mean, I picked like tough issues. And, uh, and then I had the students in pairs prepared to facilitate. And uh, uh, so they did the facilitation um, and then we had a debrief class. And, I, and I, what I would say was perhaps one of my most unartful uh, teaching moments, <laughs> in, you know, more than 20 years of teaching, very unartful moment. You know, students come in, they're super proud, they made it, they did it. And uh, and I said, you know, congratulations, everybody. You know, you've finished. Um, and um, facilitation is about enabling really hard conversations. And you all succeeded in making sure that nothing happened today. <laughs> uh, not skillful, <laughs> very bad. Uh, not, do differently for me, right? But what they had done was... Um, anytime anyone started to kind of assert a strong view, they diverted it. They diverted it to another topic, right? They didn't dig in. Um, and that felt like a loss. Um, and it, I think it was a real loss. Uh, and, um, and so finding some ways to help people be assertive and actually lean into the discomfort is really important. And so this goes to this kind of last piece that I think is important, that critical. Um, when we're doing at least our professional work, I mean, in our day-to-day -day life, I think it's also, we need to be thoughtful about it, right? But how do we build a low risk container to do this kind of conflict resilience work? And you may notice that I'm not using the word safe. Um, that is very intentional. Um, and that is because while I would love to, do something that is safe, I don't think I have that capacity. Because if I'm bringing people into the room with really different viewpoints and really different life histories and lots of strong emotions, I don't really have an ability to control um, how people are gonna feel and what people are gonna say. What I can do is create some conditions, hopefully, that make it safer or lower risk to actually speak. Um, and I think part of that work um, is, um, first of all, making like being clear about the expectations and goals of a particular set of pro, you know, a project, right? 
Um, I love the lots of these ideas that are coming across about dialogue, right? Um, what is dialogue versus joint problem solving versus at the end, we're going to tie it up in a bow with three things we agree on, you know, with, you know, whatever it is, but being really, really clear. And then making sure when you have the ability that you're bringing the right people to into the room. Um, and sometimes you have that ability. Um, I think a real big issue that um, has come up in the work that I do, and I suspect many of you do, um, is how do you account for power differences? Um, and I think that, um, in fact, I've actually heard as an objection to conflict resilience work that you can't bring people to the room because the power differences get replicated in the room. What I would say is, I think that's I think that's true. Well, the part that I think is true is power differences can get replicated in the room. Uh, that's the part I think is true, and that part of the work of the facilitation is to do what you can to narrow narrow those power differences. Right. I don't use the word neutrality because I don't actually think that's possible. I think my role is to enable voice and to enable listening. That's what I'm doing, enabling voice and enabling listening, empowering those things. But I also think I think is not true is saying you can't bring people into the room because there's power differences. Because if we're going to wait for there's no power differences, we'll never bring them into the room. Um, so um, and then thinking a lot about um, what kind of ground rules or share norms you might set up. This, there's nothing by the, the I'm going to give you two examples. There's nothing talismanic about these are just two examples that I've used. Um, one, one, you may see one thing there called the raggedy. This is perhaps one of my most favorite ones, and it is not for me. Um, I do a lot of work with an organization called Seeds of Peace. And um, they're, some of you may be familiar with them. Um, they started in 1993, really doing um, dialogue work between Israelis and Palestinians at a summer camp in Maine. Um, and they continue to do that work, but have also brought in uh, different regions, including India, Afghanistan, and Pakistan, and in the last few years, the United States. But the ground rule of be raggedy is basically just giving people permission to say, I want to be raggedy here, which means I'm going to try to say this as best I can. I appreciate it might not land well on somebody. Please re receive it in a spirit of me trying to be thoughtful. And if it doesn't land on you right, let me know, but try to separate out the negative intentionality. So setting up some ground rules, right? Setting up some expectations can be really important. Okay, I wanna make sure I leave, okay, I'm doing okay. I wanna make sure that I end this by like 9.45 so that at least there's 15 minutes for some questions. So I may be a little quicker on this. Um, uh, Cause all of this, like people may have different views on it, but I think there's some implications for our field and um, in this particular way, which is that I think a lot of the ways uh, many of us, including me, just to be clear, <laughs> sell our work, right, is around solving problems, right? Hire us and we will resolve your conflict. We will give you a wise solution. We will find a mutually beneficial outcome, right? In a caring way, we solve problems, right? It's the same thing, right, over and over. Uh, and I think what's challenging is that conflict resilience I think can may well solve problems, right? For sure. Again, I'm not opposed to that. And also, I think its value is independent of problem solving. And so the question in my mind for our field is kind of like, what do we think about this? And is there a way that we can prioritize this if we think it's important for polarization, for our society, et cetera? Um, and I would say some of the kind of objections, maybe that's a strong word, but resistance or queries or questions, right, have kind of fallen into these, these categories. Sometimes uh, I've heard, I've had people say to me something like, you know, that sounds great, but it's really not what we do. Moreover, the reason why I entered this field, right, is I actually want to make them feel like they're making progress toward the problem solving, right? So like, this is not my, it's not our jam, it's not my jam. Um, I think related to this, I don't think this has been said directly, but I've also often get the sense, and sometimes I have had the sense, that success is finding a solution. Success is three things we could agree upon um, in some way. Um, and so I think part of the work that I've tried to do for myself is think about like, that's actually not success in this work, right? Success is being in the room 
learning something and having a different story about the other person. I think another, and this is one that I love ideas on, right? Um, which is, I've had some people say like, I don't think that conflict resilience really is all that important. Like we just solve the problem. Like we don't, or, or like, why should I be uncomfortable? Or like, we're busy. Um, and I don't really have good data. Um, I mean, I have stories and experiences and a view, uh, but I think that this is like work that needs to be done. Um, uh, for at least some people saying like, I'm already so busy, like this is hard to prioritize. Um, and this is one that I think is for real, right? Is that um, there's not a market. Uh, like I've had so far in, the, in my kind of writing about this and talking about this, I've had two clients that have said, we would like to hire you to do some work on conflict resilience. Whereas I've had a lot more people say, we want a conflict resolution workshop. We want a mediation. We want you to help us with the consensus building process. Um, so I think that... Um, this is like another challenge for us as a field. Um, I do believe that there is a need and a market for this. Um, I think that is by dint of some of the stories I've shared in terms of my own teaching, my own observation of ways in which I feel that as a country, we are losing this ability to kind of connect and listen and be on and, 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 and be in differences with each other. But it's also because I think it is because part of the work that I've actually done with Seeds of Peace, um, because I have been in U.S. classrooms that end up being highly avoidant, where only after class, someone will come up and tell me, this is what I really think, or this is what I really think. And then I've been in dialogue sessions with Israelis and Palestinians, um, you know, in East Jerusalem. Um, not always skillful. <laughs> Definitely tears. Uh, and by the way, very rarely shifting of views on substantive issues, but almost always shifting of views on the other person and the other story. So I want to end um, by sharing um, a brief clip of um, a TEDx-like talk. Uh, I guess it's the Stanford Business School's TEDx-like version uh, of a former uh, Seeds of Peace staff person um, talking about um, his own experience. So this is a talk that he gave uh, called What's Possible When We Stay. I mean, since Nikki, you're you're giving all these links, I, this is one I would totally recommend listening to the whole thing uh, because it's, almost, it's really a story of conflict resilience. But I'm going to just share a really brief clip uh, uh, talking about his experience working with seeds. And, uh, and then I think it'll be perfectly timed for at least 15 minutes of questions. At the height of the 2014 war in Gaza, I worked as a summer counselor at a camp dedicated to conflict resolution between Palestinians and Israelis. Camp was founded on this extraordinarily simple idea that maintaining friendships across difference could make all the difference. Teens ate, slept, played sports together, chairs were thrown, yelling was frequent, but never did tears run more freely than when camp ended. Hugs between sides literally lasted minutes. Over the years, camp alumni communication channels, once so effusive and friendly, grew volatile with time and then silent. But under the surface were incredible stories of lives changed, even saved, because friends made the decision to show up for each other. In May of 2019, when violence spiked again in Gaza, a Palestinian man placed a call to a commander in the Israeli Defense Forces with a single request, please protect my family. Mm. His former campmate replied, of course, my friend, they will be safe. What makes these moments so impactful is not just the decision to pick up the phone, to reach out. It's also on the other side about how we choose to answer the call. So I'm gonna end with that question of, you know, how do we choose to answer the call? Um, it looks like we have just about 15 minutes. So I think I will stop the share and, um,
welcome questions. Hmm. Thank, thank you so much. There have been lots of comments and reflections. And one of the things our speakers say uh, is they really enjoy going back and looking through at all the riffs and ideas that come off. There were two questions uh, of kind of an academic uh, overlap uh, nature that I thought would be good to ask uh, at the end. Um, one was from Diane who asked if you know the work of Edwin Rush at the Center for Building a Culture of Empathy. Um, and then the other one, uh, was from Sarah Barnes, who wanted to ask you if you could comment on how your work intersects with the work that Peter Coleman does. And I'm not sure if you're familiar with either of those two uh, fabulous uh, people, um, but I wanted to pitch those out as a, as a starter and then encourage everybody, you can either raise your hand or ask live uh, as we have a few minutes remaining. But again, just to, to thank you for a really <laughs> fabulous, fabulous presentation. Oh, great. Well, thank you. Th um, so this is, um, I mean, I, I know that I was going to be learning some things. I actually don't know, uh, uh, what is the name? Edwin's work? Um, I don't know it. Um, yeah. I'm super, I, so no. So I'm going to, uh, I'm going to learn about it. Uh, I know it was a yes or no question and I, I have a boring no answer. <laughs> um, I do know Peter Coleman's work and um, I, you know, I think that there's a lot of uh, a lot of overlap um, in it, you know, and um, uh, so, yeah, I think that's probably all I would say to those ones. Yeah. Excellent. Well, I will, I will post a, a link to the, the center for building is, a culture of empathy. Is it in the chat somewhere or no? I um, am. I, yes, okay. it is in the chat okay. and, uh, and okay. I will uh, follow up. As okay. Well. Thank you for that though. Thank you. Someone just wrote that Peter Coleman was actually on the call. Ah, I hope I didn't say anything that made him go away. I just hope I he doubt it. Uh, <laughs> uh, other questions or comments or um, yeah, yeah, Prabha. Thank you, thank you for a wonderful, rich beginning of the year and for pulling together so many fields of practice, research, knowledge, data, and information. Uh, there were a couple of questions, yeah. uh, you know, when, when you talked about data, a lot of what's happening in the U.S., I'll try to be really quick about it because what I really want is a discussion. Um, there's a lot of discussion about what's been happening, particularly in the United States around listening and dialogues and people across divides coming together to have conversations, as we all know. There's also a lot of research in the peace building field about the value of building relationships based on joint problem solving versus dialogue for the sake of yeah. dialogue. Yeah. And so when you say, when you said there isn't enough data and we all have the anecdotal, the incidental, I'm just wondering how we can pull in some of the theories of change about deepening trust, empathy, and relationships through joint problem solving. In fact, Joe Bubman at Urban Rural Action, uh, based on that theory of change, has been doing some work uh, around preventing violent extremism and radicalization. So mm. I just share that to, um, to provoke some thinking and maybe some discussion around how that set of data might intersect with what you're talking about, because I completely agree. I mean, we started conflict literacy as a concept a couple of years ago for the Conflict Transformation Institute and created a whole curriculum that uh, you might want to take a look at, but I will yeah. deepen it with what yeah. you've shown today. Yeah, I would love that. I would love that. And I think it's really interesting. I mean, uh, a number of people have, I think, kind of critiqued my, or, or, or I think in a maybe a really helpful way, my, I would say not aversion, but, but kind of desire to detach the problem solving. And it's it's gotten me thinking more that I probably should do that. And I think about, I think where the, like, um, the genesis of my desire to detach, I think is maybe too kind of specific to me in this way. Um, in these years when I was teaching this facilitation class, I would occasionally, actually not infrequently, um, try to get people to participate in these facilitated dialogues and someone would sign up, right? Usually we were getting like graduate students um, 
And then like, I'd get a note from them saying, oh, like now that I understand that it's really just a dialogue, I'm afraid I won't be able to join. I either thought A, that we were gonna do something afterwards um, or B, that I would be able to brush up on my debate skills. <laughs> um, and so there is this weird thing that made me just feel like this is valuable even if we don't do those things, right? Uh, which I think you said, right, that there is research on that. But I think all, I mean, and I've seen some of this uh, uh, research, right, that shows that when there is some joint thing to work on, right, that that also, that that is extremely powerful. So it's probably like a both and um, piece that really is important. Um, and yeah, probably I definitely would be interested in looking at that curriculum as well. Bonsad, I think it's up to you. And then Batilde, you're next. Great. Stop not has her hand up. Yeah. It's my turn. Thank Go. you. Yeah. So um, thank you very much, uh, Bob. Um, my daughter has been uh, for a few years in Seeds of Peace. So um, she went through a few of the workshops uh, with you and um, still many challenges there in this organization. You probably know. Yeah. Um, there's a question that is very fresh. Um, all the time when I teach students and in my own life that is coming up over and over again, and I find it really challenging is when, you know, students um, learn all the, the package of all those skills and your approach very much resonates with what I title being uncomfortable in the uncomfortable. Mm. Um, and um, they ask, okay, we have all those skills, but what if we encounter people who don't and they avoid or fight and they have more power and they are not interested? Um, and I find it in my life too. I'm reaching out, I'm trying to talk with people. Um, I'm doing all this you know, work that I know theoretically and practically, but um, people don't wanna be there. They just don't. So I wonder what's your take about that? Yeah. So um, that's a great question. And I think, and I think uh, I have seen that as well. I mean, so for me, I think of a few, I think of a few things, right? First, um, depending on the context, right? Um, you know, is it were, is there an opportunity to learn more about why, right? Like the resistance to me is a conversation potentially in and of itself. Um, now, I may decide the answer to that is no. Um, if I decide the answer to that is yes, I may still get, I don't want to be a part of it. Then I think the next question for me always is how important is this to the success of something I'm working on or the success of a community or the success of like an organization? Um, and if it is highly successful, then I think it's funny, maybe, maybe this is because of my background, right? I tend to move more into a negotiation stance, which might be, are there other people here in this organization to whom this person might defer or listen differently? So just to give an example of some work that uh, I've been doing in a nonprofit um, around DEI issues specifically, um, where there were some some people who were feeling like they didn't need to or want to participate in in the process really right um, and um, I did not think a good approach would be like forcing them to do it um, because that would be a return to power um, and um, I was unsuccessful right but it became apparent that there were a few people in the organization who they had some trust with um, and who were willing to have conversations with them. Um, so, so I think it's somewhat context specific. Um, for me, there's, um, you know, a curious piece to it. I know, you know, you, you know, like for Seeds of Peace, 
I mean, on the Israeli-Palestinian side, there's certainly all sorts of complicated questions. And in the U.S. side, because we have a U.S. program, um, it can often be harder to get conservative students, uh, young people in the U.S. context, to participate. Um, and so thinking about what are the barriers, um, and, and often there's a lot more relationship building that needs to happen. Um, so but it's a real, it's a good and hard question. Alan Marks has a question. No, Alan, Batabule was Batabule was was next in line, and then I'm Alan. Sorry, good go. Then Alan. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, Bob. It's Hi. Great to see you. Thank you for being here. Yeah, thanks. For um, yeah, thanks. Um, so I'm going to bring up something that for some people I might start um, sounding like a broken record, but I I like to examine this question whenever I have um, the opportunity, mm. and that is um, what. When when you say that we become polarized, mm. what does that mean? And 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 the sort of implication, the implied question that I have is, when have we been together? Mm. Yeah. So I I think at least my feeling around uh, becoming polarized is that uh, there is. a sense that um, people's views are, are more extreme than even perhaps they are, but that even engaging the view of the other or granting that there might be some merit is a betrayal of your group. Um, so that like the sides have um, like, Put their guards up. I mean, I don't think I'm not, I don't think we've ever been together, but I think, for example, um, there, let's just take an issue like abortion. Always hard conversation to talk about, mm -hmm. uh, for sure. But it feels like a pro-life person, if they so much as grant the tiniest argument, uh or sensibility of the other side that they've that they've betrayed the other or again on the uh pro-choice side right that any conversation short of like any any admission that there's you know maybe a difference between a first and a third trimester abortion feels like jaws drop this person like needs to be sent away so so for me polarization is um, a sense that we're more extreme, maybe a fact of being more extreme, and an inability to engage that isn't seen on your side as like a betrayal. I don't know. Is that helpful? But I'm curious. It sounds like maybe you, from your perspective, things are not that different than what the way they were. No. <laughs> huh. um, you know, I I, I look with um, deep interest at yeah. the dialogue in the narrative, you know, that says that we've become more polarized. Yeah. I wonder about um, how it can serve as a distraction, right? Um, because now we're talking about being polarized rather than um, addressing the core issues. Mm. Um, and, you know, we've got a couple of minutes, there's a whole, you know, I have a, like a, <laughs> I could go on and about this, but yeah. you know, the, the, the um, idea that we are now more polarized, I think, is really more evidence of how it is that people who have been able to comfortably live their lives without, a, you know, addressing or acknowledging certain issues um, no longer could, um, particularly mm. after George Floyd um, was murdered. Mm. Um, and so that there's a certain level of shock and surprise that comes, you know, out of that. And then, you know, shock and surprise about being shocked and surprised. And, mm. um, you know, so people are, are, are really dealing with that. But um, you know, if I think back to, for example, you know, what happened with the civil rights movement, we now have this narrative of people holding hands and walking together across the, um, you know, Jer Jerry L. Pettis Bridge, uh, which has been renamed, and I need to remember what the new name is, but, <laughs> um, you know, I, I think that it could be very useful for us to um, perhaps think about acknowledging that uh, these ideas and, and fears um, about betrayal and so forth, in my experience, have always been there. 
um, and that this time is no, it's not really special in that way. And then let's just, you know, focus on the, um, the yeah. underlying. Yeah, I think that's really interesting. I mean, I, you know, uh, I mean, I don't, I don't have a, a, a perfect answer, but, you know, I also think it could be multifactored. I mean, I, I would completely agree with you. Uh, and at the same time, right, I would also say that um, during the Clinton administration, a transportation bill that brought the president to a Republican state where the senator, Republican senator met with the president and wouldn't actually be a big deal. It was just, that's what, like if the president was coming, the senators from the state and the governor would meet the president and they would do some photo op. Whereas like yesterday that felt like somehow there was like this magical bipartisan thing that was then thrown into contrast. And I don't, I feel like that's different. Mm -hmm. I, I don't, maybe, you know, or, or for example, on the international front, that there would be um, Congress senators on the opposite side of a political fence would be much more careful about um, disagreeing publicly with the president because it was important internationally. Like it was not the way you scored points, mm. political points. But now, like that's what we do. And I guess maybe I attribute some of that to polarization. To we can't ever say that the other side has done something good or reasonable because, and that feels different to me, but I don't know, maybe not, you know, or maybe it's, but maybe it's multi-factor too. Yeah. It's fodder for an awesome conversation and yeah. I would love to connect about it at some point. Yeah, I would too. I would too. I would, I would love that as well. So thank you for raising it. Thank you for asking it. So we are at that 10 a.m. magical moment uh, when we stop the recording. Um, thank you so much, Bob. This has been absolutely fabulous. I don't know if you have had a chance to see all of the praise you've gotten in the chat. Um, we will be posting it so that everyone can see it. And you even got an invitation from Peter Coleman to connect. Oh, um, great. With that, um, Nikki, can you turn off the recording? Bob has agreed to hang around for a few minutes. Uh, and we do have Alan Marks, who's been waiting. Right. Yeah, he can speak first. But my point is that uh, Bob will be with us for a few minutes, mm -hmm. and uh, you're all welcome to stay. And thank you all. Thank you for inviting me. Thanks for these great questions and your comments. I, I was able to see some of them, but I look forward to reading them all. Um, so really appreciate it. Excellent. Okay. Thank you. It's it's great when uh, our past speakers uh, unite and and question each other. So um, it's just an, an added uh, uh, benefit. I'm going to remove the spotlights from everybody and stop recording. And now we start our unofficial uh, Q and A session. So thank you to all. And can we say, Bob? Ten.